Hi, everybody. Welcome back. Uh, this is Principles of Microeconomics. I'm Professor Andrea Walters, and today we're going to look at Chapter 7, Production Costs and Industry Structure. And I do have to apologize. I lost my voice, uh, which very rarely happens. So I'm going to be a little bit hoarse today. But that shouldn't stop us from having fun and talking about how firms decide what to produce, how they choose the right mix of inputs, and what kinds of industry structures we see in terms of, you know, where there are markets with lots of firms, a few firms, that kind of thing. So Let's take a deep dive into the production and firm side of things. Get your OpenStax textbook, get your notes together, open up your PowerPoint slides, and let's get started. All right, everybody. So today what we're going to look at in this chapter are productions, uh, how firms produce goods and services, the costs associated with producing those goods and services, and then the industry structures we see where firms participate. So what kind of industries are firms a part of? So here's our outline. We're going to talk first about costs, about explicit costs and implicit costs. And those are going to be used to calculate our two kinds of profit, accounting profit and economic profit. And then we'll talk about production in the short run and costs in the short run. And then we'll talk about production in the long run and costs in the long run. And we'll talk about what those two terms mean. And there's actually a lot of new terminology in this chapter. So we're going to be looking at accounting profit, average profit, average total cost, average variable cost, constant returns to scale, diminishing marginal product, diseconomies of scale, economic profit, economies of scale, explicit costs, factors of production, firm, fixed costs, fixed inputs, implicit costs, long run, the long run average cost curve, marginal cost, marginal product, private enterprise, production, production function, production technologies, revenue, short run, short run average cost curve, total cost, total product, variable cost, and variable input. And as always, you can find all the terms that are being used in this chapter at the end of the chapter. So that's a good place to sort of reference, excuse me, if you have questions about any of those things. So let's get started. So the first thing we want to look at is we want to think about this idea of economies of scale. And we're going to talk about economies of scale a lot in this chapter and in the future when we talk about monopolies. But the big idea here is this idea that sometimes big firms have an advantage. And we think about, it used to be the example of that was Walmart. Now these days the example of that is really Amazon. Amazon started out as just being a bookseller, but now they sell almost everything. You can get produce, you can get birthday party supplies, you can get clothing, you can get auto parts, you can get anything on Amazon. One of the main reasons for their success is their model of production, their way of minimizing costs and minimizing delivery times. That's enabled Amazon to produce and distribute goods at a lower cost than any other competitor, and that's given them an advantage in the market. So we're gonna talk about some of the ideas that come into play with a firm like Amazon getting that massive advantage. So let's get started, all right? The first thing we wanna think about is we wanna start talking about the theory of a firm. And that means we want to define what a firm is. And we're going to use different terms here interchangeably. So we could say firm or producer or business. Those all mean about the same thing in our for our purposes. And what we're talking about when we talk about a firm is just an organization that combines inputs like land, labor, and capital and turns them into some output, some finished component um, or some finished um, output. And so we're talking about a firm being a producer of a good or a service, transforming inputs into output. Private enterprise is any ownership of a business producer or firm by private in inter individuals. And so you want to think about this as sort of being in opposition to publicly owned companies. So, um, things that are owned by the government or things that are publicly traded. Um, and then when we want to talk about production or the production function, uh, we want to think about the decision about who to produce, 
for what to produce, how to produce, how much to produce, and what inputs we should use in which quantities. And so the production is really just the process of combining those inputs to get those outputs. And usually what we want to do is we want to elevate the value of those inputs. So if you've ever wondered why grocery stores have a deli section, it's usually a great way for them to increase the value of their inputs. They have access to all these ingredients. And when they combine them into a deli sandwich or a pasta salad or something like that, they're increasing the value of the inputs by adding their labor to it. And that's usually what a firm or a producer does with production is take inputs and add value through the way they combine them. And that's what we're going to be looking at today. So, in terms of market structure, firms face many different competitive situations. And we can think about these as being on a spectrum. And so, the two extremes we have are perfect competition and monopoly. And the idea is that these two extremes are pretty rare, but we think about them and we use them um, because they are possible and because... They give us a sense of the two levels of competition within which most firms exist. So perfect competition is over here on one section, on one side. Perfectly competitive markets are going to have many firms that have identical profits. Perfectly competitive firms are not going to have a lot of power in terms of setting prices. And they're going to have very low barriers to entry. It's easy for new firms to enter and exit. Perfect competition is sort of considered the ideal market structure, and it's what economists like the best. Over here on the other end of the spectrum, we have a monopoly. A monopoly is a situation where there's one firm. The products are highly differentiated, or there's not very similar substitutes. Um, there might be high barriers to entry. It's hard to get into that market. And so the monopolist has a lot of market power. They have a lot of ability to set prices and affect how the market behaves. And so these are our two extremes. Perfectly competitive, perfect competition is lots of firms selling identical par par uh, products or services with no market power. And then the monopolist has the most market power, and that's because they are the only firm selling a good with no substitutes. In between the two, we have monopolistic competition and oligopoly. We're going to put monopolistic competition over here. Because what we see with monopolistic competition is a high number of firms, um, but the goods are differentiated. They're not similar. They're not identical. We see a lot of markets in our real life that are like this. If you think about the market for clothing, there are lots of producers of clothing, but you can tell the difference between a t-shirt that you buy from Walmart or Target versus a t-shirt that you get from a name brand company versus a blouse or a top, right? There's a lot of differentiation. Even in sneakers, there's a lot of differentiation. And so that means that even though there's lots of competitors, these firms have a little bit of market power because the goods aren't identical. An oligopoly, oligopoly, is a situation where there's a small number of firms. And this is when a lot of people talk about monopolies. Usually what they're actually talking about is an oligopoly. It's something like the market for sodas, right? Um, there are a handful of firms, but it's a really small number of firms. It's Pepsi-Cola and uh, Coca-Cola, and they dominate the market. So an oligopoly is a situation where there's just a few firms selling similar products, but they have a lot of market power. So many firms... Sim identical products. Many firms, similar products, but not identical. We can tell the difference. A small number of firms with similar or identical pro pro uh, products, but still a lot of market power. One firm with really unique products and a lot of market power. And so that's the way you can think about this is in terms of market power, in terms of the ability to set prices, we're going to see an increase as we go this direction with 
Perfect competition being the least and monopolies having the most. So far, so good? Okay. So now we want to think about how firms determine their success. And one of the assumptions we're going to always make is that firms want to maximize profits. We assume that in any situation, a firm wants to produce as much as they can, maximize their profits in order to be as successful as possible. That begs the question, how do we measure profits? The easiest way to measure profits is to compare revenue to costs. So profits are going to be total revenue minus total costs. And this is true for firms in any market structure. Profit is going to be total revenue minus total cost. The challenging thing is how economists define these two things. Revenue is just the income that a firm generates from selling its good or service, goods or services. So revenue is going to be the price we sell things for times the quantity sold. So if I sell uh, 100 backpacks for $20, then my revenue is 100 times 20 or $2,000. If I sell 100 tacos for $5, my revenue is 100 times 5 or $500. Total costs gets a little bit more complicated because total costs in economics, we mean everything. We mean not just explicit costs. Explicit costs are things that you spend actual money on. So wages, the price of materials, um, anything that has actual money allocated to it, out-of-pocket expenses, rent on the factory, uh, the money you spend on materials, uh, maybe money you pay for insurance, all of that is explicit. But economists also consider implicit costs. And that's a little bit harder to think about because it's not something you and I normally think about unless we're in our economic headspace. Implicit costs are going to be the opportunity cost, the other value of these goods and services. So if we decide we're going to start a food truck, our explicit costs are going to be buying the food truck, gasoline to drive it, uh, the cost of food, the wages we pay our workers, um, the cost for napkins and trays. Implicit costs are going to be things like the value of our entrepreneurship, right? The money we could make if we worked for somebody else, um, the value of our capital the money we put towards buying the food truck, what would it have been worth to put it in a savings account? And so it's the opportunity cost of resources. Um, let me give you an example of explicit and implicit costs. Let's say I have a company and it's a company that is a travel agency. That's a little unrealistic, but let's go with it. So we have a travel agency And so we have an office, but the office space is my bedroom. So I already own it, so I don't have to pay any costs. I have to pay to set up a website, and that costs $200. I have to pay someone to answer phones. So my reception person is going to cost me uh, $150 a week. And then I have materials costs. And that's $50 a week. And then I also have, I'm going to spend all my time after work working on it. So my labor um, that I'm going to spend when I'm not doing my other job. Which of these are explicit costs? Anything I spend money on. The website is an explicit cost. The receptionist's wages are an explicit cost. And the materials are an explicit cost. But that's not the only cost. Economists say, hey, listen, if I'm using my bedroom as an office, I could have used it for something else. Maybe I could have rented that extra bedroom out to someone else 
for $1,000 a month. So that's an implicit cost. So is my labor. I could have spent that time working on my business, working for Uber or DoorDash. And so I have the opportunity cost of my wages for those for that time is part of the implicit cost. So when we're thinking about economics, we want to think about total cost, including explicit and implicit costs. Does that make sense? Okay, so now that we have a sense of explicit versus implicit costs, and we know now that profit is total revenue minus total cost, we want to look at the two different ways we can measure profit. So like I said, Economists consider everything. They consider explicit and implicit costs, but not everybody does. If you've taken an accounting class or even some business classes, they aren't going to talk to you about implicit costs and opportunity costs. So accounting profit is only going to look at total revenue. Let me get it for color. Total revenue minus explicit costs. But economic profit is going to look at total revenue minus explicit and implicit costs. So that means that economic profit is always going to be lower than accounting profit because economists are going to consider the value of everything. They're considering everything, even the things you don't pay for, because they believe everything has a value because it could have been used to do something else. If you use your savings, if you use your own equipment that you own from home, it's not that you had to pay for it explicitly, but it has value. And so economic profit is going to be that total revenue minus explicit and implicit costs. Whereas accounting profit is only total revenue minus explicit costs. For our purposes throughout the chapter, we're going to talk about total revenue minus total costs, and we're going to assume that those implicit costs are factored in. So, Think about another example. Uh, think about the production of pizza. If we want to open a pizza shop, we're going to have to order ingredients. We're going to have to hire pizza makers. We're going to need tools and equipment. We're also going to need things like a pizza oven. And what we're going to find is, and this is what we're going to talk about now in this chapter, some of these things vary a lot day to day. And some of these things stay the same for long periods of time. And so in economics, we differentiate between the short run when there are things that we can change day to day, things like our labor and materials, right? I can hire a new person, lay someone off. And the long run when uh, it might take some time to get something done, like open up a new shop or buy a second pizza oven or sell a pizza oven. And so we're going to start out by looking at the short run and production and costs in the short run, and then we'll take it to the long run and look at how that is different and how that's the same, okay? So the first thing we want to think about is our production function. And our production function is just saying, hey, there is a function, there is a way that we combine inputs to get an output. And so in our example with the pizza place, our output is pizza. And our input is going to be the land we put our pizza shop on, the labor we hire to make pizzas, sell them, maybe delivery drivers, the capital. So that's going to be the big equipment, um, like maybe the pizza oven, definitely uh, factories of any kind. Um, if we need a business loan, technology, we can think about basic technology like pizza ovens, or we can think about um, our website and the technology we use to process payments. And then our entrepreneurship. And entrepreneurship is sort of one of those newer factors. The original factors of production were just land, labor, and capital. But technology and entrepreneurship say, hey, like there's some value to 
the technology we're applying to these situations, and to the personal um, contributions of entrepreneurs, people who start businesses or say, hey, we need a vegan pizza place in town. We need a pizza place that sells by the slice, those kinds of things. So our production function says, hey, there is some output Q, which maybe in our example is pizzas. And it is going to be a function of our inputs, like natural resources, like labor, like capital, like technology, and entrepreneurship. And all of those things go into the process of producing our good or our service. Does that make sense? So every firm's got some production function, some way of combining different levels of these inputs in different quantities and in different ways to get their specific output, whether it's a uh, land, let's say pizza oven, a uh, point of sale system, pizza makers, ingredients, etc. Right? So our production function is just how we turn our inputs into an output. Does that make sense? The factors of production are all the different things that go into the production function to make the output Q. Okay, now we're back with our production function. And what we want to notice is that these different inputs that make our output Q are all different in terms of how we would relate to them as we produce. And so we want to start to categorize them as fixed or variable. And so fixed inputs are factors of production that can't easily be increased or decreased over time. So we're going to think about things like the land might be fixed, the pizza oven won't vary over time or as we increase and decrease production. Our point of sale system, right? How we process payments, that's going to be fixed. Um, but other things, our ingredients and our labor, those are going to tend to be variable inputs. They are going to change over time. They are going to increase and decrease as production increases. If our sales double, we might hire another worker. We'll definitely have to hire more stuff. And so now what we want to think about is a sort of simplified production function. And that's what we see here on the screen on your slides is this simplified production function where what we're really looking at is our output being a function of two main categories of inputs. Fixed inputs like capital and variable inputs like labor. And that's how we're going to sort of gather up all of our inputs is into these two categories. And that's going to allow us to talk about production more efficiently, more quickly, more simply. Those other things are still there, but we could kind of lump them all together into labor and capital. So what's the difference between the fixed inputs and the variable inputs? Well, it helps us understand the difference between short run and long run. In the short run, we usually only change our variable inputs, but things like our factory, our restaurant, our land, our capital, those are fixed in the short run. And we can think about the short run being day to day, month to month. The long run is when all factors can be changed. We can open a new store or completely shut down. And a nice way to think about the short run versus the long run is to think about restaurants during 2020, during the pandemic. In the short run, some restaurants just shut down, stores just shut down. Um, there was nothing they could do. Um, they might eventually figure out how to do delivery and that kind of thing. Some stores eventually went out of business. That happened in the long run when they could liquidate their equipment, um, lease the land back, those kinds of things. And so the long run is when we can change those fixed variables, those fixed inputs, things like our capital, our land, our office space, our big equipment. 
So if we want to think about the idea of short run and long run, the book has this great example of lumberjacks using a two-person saw. And so in this example, the output is the lumber that those lumberjacks are producing, right? They're producing wood that they saw up. The total product. The capital is fixed in the short run. The amount of labor is going to be our variable input that we can only alter in the short run. Um, since capital is fixed in the short run, the amount of trees we cut down per day, the amount of lumber we produce, the amount of Q we get is a function of how many lumberjacks we change, how many lumberjacks we apply to our production function. And there's a great table in the book where they talk about the number of lumberjacks and the marginal product of each lumberjack. So if we have, oh, that didn't like to come off. Let's try this a different way. That is not a good pen to use. Sorry, y'all. If we have one lumberjack producing, cutting down four trees, that's going to give us a marginal product of four trees. If we have two lumberjacks, they're going to be able to cut down 10 trees. That means that that second lumberjack's marginal product is an additional six trees. The third lumberjack gets us to a total product, a total number of trees cut down of 12. But that means that that third lumberjack is only responsible for adding to two trees to our total. And then the fourth lumberjack gets us to 13, which means they're only responsible for adding one more tree. So we have our total product here, the number of trees cut down, and our marginal product is how much each additional lumberjack contributes to the total. From 10, from 4 to 10 is, or sorry, from 0 to 4 is 4, from 4 to 10 is 6, from 10 to 12 is 2, from 12 to 13 is 1. Does that make sense? So again, when we talk about marginal, it's just a fancy economics way of saying each additional unit. Cool? So that's our marginal product. It's how much our total product changes, change in total product, divided by change in labor. So if total product goes from 4 to 10, then our change in total product is 6 and our labor goes from two, 1 to 2, so our change in labor is 1. 6 divided by 1 is 6. Does that make sense? So the marginal product of anything is going to be the additional output produced by that input. The marginal product of labor is how much each worker adds. And any input is going to obey the law of diminishing marginal productivity. It's the general rule that as a firm employs more of one input, holding everything else constant, ceteris paribus, eventually the amount of output is going to decline. And for helping people understand the law of diminishing marginal productivity, I like to think about a food truck again. So let's say we have a food truck. If there's no one in the food truck, how much are we producing? Let's say if we have our food truck with no people in it, we are going to produce zero output. So our total product is going to be zero. If we hire one person in our food truck, they're going to be pretty efficient. They're going to have to work really hard, but they're going to help us sell maybe, let's say, 10 meals. That's great. So our marginal product, our change in total product divided by change in labor is going to be 10 over 1 or 10. Now we have two workers. That's great. One person runs the cash, cash register, the other one cooks. Maybe that gets us to 19 meals. That means that one more worker got us a marginal product of labor of 9. 
Maybe the third worker helps and now we've got someone doing prep. It's going to make us more efficient, but no one's going to have as much an impact as going from zero to one. So maybe now we go to 26. That means that third worker adds seven units of marginal product, seven more meals. Now, adding another worker, the fourth worker in that food truck is going to start to get crowded. We're going to see the marginal product start to go down. So now we're only going to get to, say, 30 meals, and that's a marginal product of 30 minus 26, 4. That's that diminishing marginal productivity. So hopefully that makes sense. If not, let me know in the comments or in the discussion threads or send me an email and I'll produce a video that shows you a little bit of a deeper dive into the law of diminishing marginal productivity. We can see another example here where the book is showing us the short run total product of trees. The number of trees produced goes up. The total product goes up with each additional lumberjack. Oops, sorry. But on the margin, each additional lumberjack is a little bit less productive than the previous. So that's that diminishing marginal product. We can see a sort of stylized version here where we see the total product curve going up, but the marginal product curve eventually going down. Cool? Cool. So now we can get to costs in the short run. And when we think about costs in the short run, we want to think about this idea of fixed versus variable inputs. So when we think about fixed versus variable inputs, we're going to know that some of our costs are fixed and some of our costs are going to be variable. All of our costs are considered factor payments. They are those explicit costs, things the firm has to pay for, raw materials, rents, wages, salaries, interests, uh, dividends, uh, profits, all of those things are payments, factor payments, payments going to those factors of production. But when we think about the economics of it, we want to remember we talked about total costs being combined, a combination of fixed co uh, explicit costs and implicit costs. Well, we can also break down total cost into fixed costs and variable costs. And so fixed costs are going to be costs for fixed inputs or fixed factors of production. Things like land and capital. Variable costs are going to be for our variable inputs. Things like labor and materials. So our variable costs are going to fluctuate as we increase production and change in the short run. Our fixed costs are going to stay the same day to day, month to month, and our total cost is the sum of both. We're going to have a lot of different definitions of cost now, so I think it's really useful to take really careful notes about this because it's going to get complicated um, and it can be really useful to do an example. So we can also define costs in terms of how they change as productivity changes. The first version of that is what's called average total cost. An average total cost is just taking total cost divided by quantity. It is how much it costs to produce at every level of production. So it's Total cost divided by one unit, two units, three units, five sandwiches, six subway rides, whatever we're talking about. Marginal cost is the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity. And that's the cost of each additional unit. So if I go from selling five burritos to selling six burritos, and my total cost go from $5 to $5.50, the marginal cost is that extra 50 cents of producing that sixth burrito. Probably going to be a change in those variable costs. Average variable costs and average fixed costs are going to be defined as fixed costs and variable costs divided by quantity. So let me get some more pen colors here to keep this colorful and interesting. We can think about average total cost 
being total cost divided by quantity. We also have average fixed cost and average variable cost. And then marginal cost <coughs> is just the change in total cost divided by the change in quantity or the cost of each additional unit. And that's the way you really want to think about it because usually in our examples, Q is going to change by one, so we want to know how much cost changes, changes as we increase production by one more unit. At production equal to zero, when we're not producing anything, we're going to have variable costs be zero because that's going to mean we are not producing anything. But we still have to pay our fixed costs no matter what. Our fixed costs in this example are $160. So maybe it's the rent on our facility. Maybe it's our insurance premium. But it's stuff we have to pay whether we produce or not. Variable costs are going to increase as we increase production because we're going to need more materials to make each level of output. And remember, variable costs plus fixed costs give us our total cost. We can look at our cost curves as having these sort of general relationships depicted in that graph there. And I always think it's easier to see it in color, so let me give you my version of it. Overall, generally, we are going to see that as we change and increase the quantities we produce, we are going to see marginal cost look kind of like a fish hook, and then Average total cost is going to go from up here to like this and kind of look like a smiley face. And then average variable cost is going to come from lower and have that same smiley face relationship. And there are a couple of things I want you to notice. First of all, Marginal cost is going to try to is going to always cross average total cost and average variable cost at their minimums. Second of all, see this difference here between average total cost and average variable cost? That's fixed costs. Because the difference between average total cost and average variable cost at a quantity of say 1 is how much variable costs are for that first unit and how much total cost was for that first unit. Total cost minus fixed cost is variable cost. And so that's why we're going to see average total cost and average variable cost get closer and closer together because if fixed cost stays the same, if it's say $160 at every price, at every quantity, when we divide it by 10, we get 160 divided by 10 is 16. When we divide it by 20, it's going to get smaller. Divided by 30, it gets smaller. So that average fixed cost is going to get smaller and smaller, and average total cost and variable cost are going to get closer and closer together. Does that make sense? Marginal cost is shaped this way because of that diminishing marginal productivity. Okay? So, if you're having a little bit of trouble with this, do let me know. This is a little bit complicated, and I'd be happy to do a really nice example where we can work on this together. So, that is our cost curves, and there's a detailed example in the textbook, but like I said, I'm happy to do a detailed example for y'all if you have more questions. What does this have to do with how firms make money? Well, this helps us understand profit, because... Profit comes from price minus cost. Total profit is total revenue minus total cost. And if we think about it, average total cost is total cost divided by quantity. So if we're looking at the average cost, we're looking at the cost per unit of production. So our average profit or our profit margin is going to be 
equal to the price we sell each unit for minus the average total cost of the unit we're selling at the time. Does that make sense? Another way of saying it is if we wanted to look at total profit, we would look at price times quantity minus total cost or average total cost times quantity. This is just taking the quantity out. If the market price is greater than the average cost, then our profit is going to tend to be positive. Our average profit will be positive. If price is below the average cost, then our profits are going to be negative, meaning that the firm is going to be losing money, taking losses. Okay? Does that make sense? So, what we want to think about here is we want to think about a firm's profitability and a firm's profit margin. It's going to be based on how much they're able to sell their goods for and their ability to minimize costs. Okay? So that's the short run version of it. The long run version is going to be a little bit more complicated because now it's not just that our fixed costs are fixed. In the long run, we can change anything. So in the short run, a firm can't break their lease. They can't, you know, end a contract with um, some providers. But in the long run, you can sell the factory, sell off the equipment. You can change anything. So in the long run, all factors are variable. And that means that the long run production function is going to be the most efficient way to produce output because firms are going to have the ability to not just change those variable factors, but change all factors, okay? So in the long run, we're going to expect all costs to be variable, not just labor and materials, but capital too. And so in the long run, we're going to consider our production technology, which is just a fancy way of saying the way we combine our inputs to get our outputs. So if you remember, we had our production function Q equals F of L and K, where L is our variable inputs like labor and K is our fixed inputs like capital. F is the technology, the production technology. And so what we're saying here is in the long run, we can find the optimal combination of L and K. And that's where this idea of economies of scale comes in. Economies of scale is a situation where as quantity goes up, the cost per unit goes down. And so this is the idea that it's easier to produce a lot of something than a little of it. And so sometimes we could say, okay, yeah, um, producing more burritos in our taco truck is going to get more expensive because we have to buy more materials. But let's say instead of having a food truck, we have a burrito factory. If we can change our production technology, change our capital, we can actually lower the cost of producing a burrito by getting better equipment that's more efficient. That's this idea of economies of scale. Scaling production up to a point where we can produce at a really low cost per unit. So that's like the difference between manufacturing a sweater in a factory versus knitting a sweater at home. When you can change your capital, change your fixed inputs, change your production technology, you can find a situation where the quantity goes up and the cost per unit goes down. And that's what economies of scale are. It's this idea that producing a large quantity can be cheaper if you can change the technology, if you can change your capital. So here we have an example of a production function that's exhibiting economies of scale. Producing those first thousand units costs $12. But point M, the firm is actually producing even more. It's producing 1,200 units, but the cost of per unit of production, the average total cost has gone down to $8. And as they increase production up to five, they see, <coughs> excuse me, the economies of scale beginning to slow down, but still existing. Producing 5,000 units is the lowest cost production point. 
So economies of scale exist because the larger scale of production leads to lower average cost. We see this a lot with manufactured goods. It's easier to produce a lot of them than a few of them. My favorite example is buttons. It's much easier to buy a machine that stamps buttons out of a material than it is to make a button by scratch, from scratch at home, carving it out or something like that. It's way cheaper to have the kind of capital that has economies of scale, that exhibits economies of scale, meaning you're producing more at a lower cost. So this gets to another type of curve. We talked about marginal cost curve, average total cost curve, average variable cost curve. Now we're going to talk about long run average cost curve and short run average cost curve. And that's the idea that our average cost curve is going to change shape depending on whether we can alter our technology and take advantage of those economies of scale or not. The long run average cost curve shows the lowest possible average cost of production, allowing all inputs to produ production to vary so that the firm can produce the best technology. So this is like the idea of going from the food truck to the burrito factory. The long run average cost curve allows us to change our fixed inputs to lower cost to the lowest possible level. In the short run, the short run average cost curve is the average total cost curve in the short term. When we can't alter those fixed inputs, we can only alter those variable inputs. And so what we're going to see is that diminishing marginal product in the short run average cost curve. And that's going to mean that we're going to see those curves be shorter and more U-shaped, less flat, and less prone to economies of scale. Okay, so now here is where we put it all together. So let's say we have five different short run average cost curves that exhibit different levels of production for a firm. So we could be at short run average cost curve one, and then we could increase our productivity to short run average cost curve two, short run average cost curve three, and so on, all the way up to five. Each of these short run average cost curves represent a different level of fixed cost. So maybe this is our first food truck, our second food truck, uh, now we have a brick and mortar location, another brick and mortar location, something like that. Um, off the top of my head, I'm thinking about a local Sacramento taco and burrito place, uh, Chondo's Tacos. They started out with one restaurant, two restaurants, a food truck, a second food truck. Now they have multiple locations, multiple food trucks. And as they increase their production, their long run average cost curve exhibits those different economy of scale points over different levels of capital. So each short run average cost curve shows a different level of capital in the short run, and the long run average cost curve shows all of those different optimal points where these firms are minimizing costs by producing at different optimal levels. Does that kind of make sense? So we can imagine a world where there are actually infinite short run average cost curves for every possible level of capital. And a firm is going to pick the optimal quantity based on the short run average cost curve that they're on at the time. But in the long run, in years, there are multiple points that are optimal. The other thing this graph is showing is the different versions of economies of scale. So economies of scale occur when average costs are falling. That's when you can save money by producing more because the costs are going down, right? From here to here. Constant returns to scale is this point where producing a little bit more actually doesn't cost any more. It costs as much to produce Q2 as Q3. 
The returns to scale are constant. The production increases equal to the increase in inputs. And then diseconomies of scale is over here when the cost curves are upward sloping. And that's just saying, hey, now going from producing Q5 to producing, say, Q6, that's going to give us a higher cost. The economies of scale are exhausted. It's diseconomies of scale. It's each unit costs more than the last unit. Does that make sense? It's, this is about as complicated as this chapter gets. Um, but the big idea is that there's an optimal size of a firm, and that's at that constant returns to scale part, and it can happen in the short run on the short run average cost curve, and in the long run on the long run average cost curve. If costs are falling, we should increase production. If costs are rising, we should decrease production because we want to be where costs are minimized. Because if we can't control price, we want to make sure we control costs. And the way we control costs is by keeping them low. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. So... Constant returns to scale are when expanding all inputs proportionately does not change the average cost of production. It's this point right here where the curve is flat and adding one more unit costs proportionately the same amount. Diseconomies of scale are when long run average costs of producing each additional unit is increasing. It's when a firm or a factory or a company is so large that it's difficult to manage or difficult to run efficiently. And so you can think about a company like, um, what's a good example? Um, a company that's so big they can't manage themselves. Maybe they don't know what's going on with each individual employee or they don't know what's going on at different locations. And so they're actually costing more to produce uh, what they're producing and they'd be more efficient if they pulled back a little bit, okay? Um, so you can think about this being coordination issues or something like that. So, what does this have to do with the last section? The last section we want to talk about here is the idea of size and number of firms in an industry. The shape of the long run average cost curve helps us understand how many firms will compete in an industry and whether the firms in the industry have different sizes or tend to be the same size. So this long run average cost curve tells us if these short run average cost curves are close together, are wide, are small, and how many firms can produce the optimal quantity of a good in a given market. And so our sense of the long run average cost curve really helps us understand things like how many firms are in the industry, which is what we started talking out, uh, started out talking about in the first place. So if we think about this first average cost curve, this long run average cost curve here has a clear minimum R is where costs are minimized. And so low cost firms will produce at point R. And most of the firms, if they're gonna be cost minimizers, they're all gonna be about the same size producing 10,000 units. On the other hand, at, in graph B, we see a flat bottom long run average cost curve, more like this. And this tells us there are different sizes of firm that would be optimal. So in this example, firm a firm with 5,000 units produced or a firm that produces 20,000 units would both be cost minimizers. In my example, Q2, Q3, and Q4 are all at about that constant returns to scale point. That means that we can have small and big firms competing with each other while still being cost minimizers, not being on that economies of scale or diseconomies of scale part of the curve where they should be bigger or smaller, okay? So what this tells us is, it tells us a little bit about what size firms can compete in these markets. Cool? All right. Let me know what you think. This was a lot of information. Um, if you have some questions, I'm happy to go over with them with you. And if we have time, I'll put together an example for you all, if you're interested, that talks about how these firm costs behave. Okay? So please let me know what questions you have, what you think is the most interesting or confusing. Come by office hours, comment in the YouTube or in the discussion threads, or shoot me an email if you'd like some more practice 
with firm costs and um, short run, long run firm behavior and those kinds of things. Thanks so much and have a great day.